Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our series of lectures on ethical implication of AI. My name is Roberto Zicari. I'm pretty pleased to introduce you the lecture of today. Today, the lecture goes into another level. We seen yesterday, for those of you who made it, a uh, AI into a domain, healthcare. In this particular lecture, we go one level down. We go towards machine learning. So if some of you have attended some of the lecture before, we started with concepts that are really very high level, humankind, value, moral values, ethics. And now we're going into a journey where you see the level changes. Yesterday, we talked about patients and uh, doctors. Today, I have a great pleasure to introduce you my colleague, Gemma Roig. Gemma just joined our university in January this year, and uh, she's already very active. We're also working together. So it's really a great pleasure to give you the floor, Gemma. The floor is on you. Um, okay, so good afternoon everyone and uh, thank you Roberto for inviting me to give this lecture. As Roberto said, uh, I joined Getty University this uh, last January and I've been actively involved in working with Roberto and all the team in uh, this amazing journey um, towards ethical AI. And uh, I think it's a very important topic and I'm very excited uh, about being part of this amazing team. Uh, so for uh, today's uh, lecture, I want to focus uh, more about fairness, bias and discrimination in AI and what it means and how it also relates to what we understand of bias or cognitive bias. So we can have also a point of reference um, with humans. Um, okay. Um, so before I start, I uh, wanted to post here a picture of me because this is a bit unusual way of doing a lecture. So you can picture me uh, giving, this is another lecture in uh, 2018. Maybe I changed a bit, but not that much. And I also wanted to kind of give a disclaimer um, so we are talking about here ethics uh, for AI. And of course, this uh, lecture is very uh, based and influenced based on my background, which is mainly machine learning and AI, uh, but also with the discussions with experts from other domains. And as I said, um, it has been pivotal for me uh, this past month uh, being part of the team uh, with uh, mainly people from many different do domains discussing this uh, ethics for AI topic, which is very important. So as I said, I wanted to start a lecture uh, giving a bit of motivation and linking uh, bias uh, with human bias. So with a kind of a bit provocative question, if uh, you want to say it, which is, are we biased? Um, so I want uh, just, as I said, to, to give this motivational uh, introduction, uh, so tackle this question from social psychology perspective. Uh, so just a, a brief uh, comment on social psychology, uh, because I know that there are people from many backgrounds. So this is uh, the scientific study of how people think about influence and relate to one another. So for instance, um, with respect to social thinking, it studies how we perceive ourselves and others, what we believe, the judgments that we make and our attitudes. And it also st studies the social influence based on culture, pressures to conform, persuasion, and the influence from groups of people and individuals. So very importantly, and quite uh, related to our topic of today, it studies also prejudice, and moreover also aggression, attraction, and intimacy, as well as helping others as part of social relations. 
So it's really very closely related to sociology, but it studies more the individuals and it also does more experiments uh, to validate hypotheses that support their theories. So as I said, this is not a lecture on uh, social psychology and I, I won't go much into it. Uh, I put uh, here a book that if you are interested in social psychology as a reference and I also give you as reference Wikipedia, which has amazing um, and very good uh, definitions and with more references that you can follow. And as I said, it's a great, great source and it's for free. So let me just um, go a little bit insight into what uh, it's important for us today. So bias, remember the question, are we biased? Is closely related uh, to prejudice and stereotyping. Uh, so, what is prejudice? So, it's an affective feeling towards a person based on their perceived group or membership. So, it's towards this individual person only because uh, it is perceived that forms part of a larger group. This uh, preconceived evaluation of another person is based on some personal char characteristics or uh, other factors uh, that makes uh, these characteristics makes a position or makes us think that this person belongs to this particular group. Uh, so we have this feeling based on this association with the group, not because of the particular individual. And in social psychology is uh, usually perceived as something, so prejudice as something unfavorable, okay? So not so positive. So prejudice uh, can be based on several factors, for instance, social class, race or ethnicity, nationality, values, beliefs, religion, political affiliation, occupation, so what do you do for a living, where do you work, disability, language, beauty, gender, age, etc. So uh, there might be uh, several, several uh, grounds here. So this brings me to uh, stereotypes. So what is a stereotype? So it's an expectation that people might have about every person of a particular group. So it's somehow an overgeneralized belief about a particular category of people. So here we are not talking about individuals, but about the groups. So for instance, here in this example, um, I found this picture about cultural stereotypes. So if someone is from some cultural background, we might have some stereotype about each of the individuals um, that they should uh, conform conform these stereotypes that we might have as a belief. So this might lead to social or leads to social categorization, and this is one of the reasons for prejudice attitudes. Um, so as I said in the beginning, uh, the question was, uh, are we biased? And we might say no, or we try to avoid it, or somehow, uh, of course, uh, it's protected by law, so we cannot do that. And I'll, I'll say more about this later. Um, and I wanted to introduce uh, to you this concept of uh, implicit bias, um, which is also called uh, unconscious bias or implicit stereotype. So this was first defined by uh, two psychologists, uh, Banaji and Greenwald, in 1995. And uh, it's, it's um, an unconscious attribution of particular qualities to a member of a certain social group. So unconscious means that we are not aware that we are doing this attribution to uh, a particular individual that forms uh, that we attribute this individual to a group, okay? So we are unaware of this, it's an unconscious attribution. So this is thought to be shaped by experience and based on learned associations, uh, 
that we might have been exposed between particular qualities and social categories. Okay. Um, here, maybe I should, uh, I should mention that uh, the existence of implicit, implicit bias is um, supported and validated by several scientific peer-reviewed articles in the psychological literature, and of course it comes with controversies. So, um, how can we assess if, if someone has an implicit bias or not? So this awareness association um, or attribution of these particular qualities to a member of a certain social group. Uh, so there is um, what is called the implicit association test or IAT, um, which um, it uh, evaluates this Im implicit social cognition of thoughts and feelings outside of the conscious awareness. So it's an unconscious, people are aware, and control. Okay, so um, throughout all my presentation, I will paste uh, the links of the sources where I took the information from, so you can go back to it. But here I just wanted to show uh, to you um, uh, this uh, project with the with this implicit association test that everyone can can do for instance here what you see is that you can take a test um, the first one for instance uh, asian america iit so implicit association test um, so here in this iit um, you will be shown or the, the subject that takes the test is shown images of white people, Asian American people, or the faces of these people, or some people, and then images of places that are either American or foreign. And then people have to make association, okay? I'm gonna give a particular example in the gender science IIT. So this gender science, and uh, you will see how it works. So what it often reveals is a relative link between liberal arts and females and between science and males, even though beforehand, um, um, the person of the test subject that is doing the test might indicate that, uh, don't, that they don't have this particular bias. So the bias is um, unconscious, okay? As I said, there are controversies about um, the results that you get from this test, but it's still interesting to look at it. Um, I just want to go very quickly uh, so you can see how this test works. And I think it's quite related because uh, then later on you will see how we do this kind of test of this uh, bias in machine learning. Okay, so for instance, in this particular case, uh, we are doing this uh, implicit association test in gender and science. Okay, so we have four categories, we have male, female, science, and liberal arts. And each of these categories has some items associated. So you are shown this beforehand, but the items are most of the times very easily relatable to the category. So male, you have man, son, and so on. Female, you have mother, wife, and so on. Science, astronomy, math, etc., and liberal arts, history, arts, humanities, and so on. So you can learn this if you don't know, but maybe if you don't know it, then uh, the implicit bias doesn't work that well. Okay, so let's continue. You press continue, and then this screen appears. So um, the test has, as you see, seven parts, and the first part, what you see, is that in the top of the screen, there are um, two categories, one on the left side and one on the right side. The one on the left side is liberal arts and the one on the right is science. So in the middle of the screen, there will be appearing uh, item, words of the items that are either belonging to category liberal arts or to the category science. Okay, so if they belong to the category liberal arts, you have to press E. 
which is actually on the left of your keyboard. And if they belong to science, you have to press I, which is on the right of your keyboard. So there is no confusion here. <laughs> so it's quite easy. So you see, and, and something very important, you have to go as fast as you can. So res respond the, the first thought that you have. So you have engineering. So engineering is an item that belongs in the category of science. So you press I and you continue. And here there are several items that uh, are displayed and, and you do until it's over. And then you go to part two. So part two is very similar to part one. But now here in this case, what you have is two different categories. So you have category male and category female. And again, it's the same distribution in the screen. So male is on the top left, female on the top right. If the item that appears in the middle of the screen is an item that belongs to female, you press I, which is on the right side of the keyboard. And otherwise, if it's male, you press E. And something I didn't say is that um, if, uh, so this gives you a feedback. If you are wrong, there is this red cross that appears. Otherwise, another word will appear in the screen and then you can continue the experiment. As an example, so you see grandpa, grandpa is male, so you go to the E. Um, there is a third part, and here the third part is a, a bit more complex, but with the same principle. So now here you have two categories per side. So you have male or liberal arts on the uh, left side and female and science on the right side. And here what you have to do is when an item appears, it will be either of the four categories and you have to press E or I depending if it belongs to one of the categories or the others. So here example, mother would belong to female, so you press I. Philosophy will belong to liberal arts, you will press E and there will be several items of all the four categories and you have to uh, do this, assign them to the right category with the two uh, keyboards. Then you repeat the same. In, in, for part four, it's exactly like part three. Now, part five, what it does is very similar to part one, but now science and liberal arts have uh, swap positions. Okay, so science now is on the left and liberal arts is on the right. But it's uh, the same kind of task that you have to do. So when there is an item appearing, you assign to one of the other. And part six, um, again, but with four categories. So now male and science in, is in the same sides and female and liberal arts are on the right side and the same side. And you repeat the same again. Okay, so what can we get from here and which kind of results uh, can we assess? So here what we get is uh, uh, results that can assess these implicit uh, stereotypes uh, held by the test subject, so the person that is doing the task, the experiment, uh, such as unconsciously associating stereotype, uh, stereotypically. So how is this done? So as I said, it is very important that you have to go as fast as possible, and you can also make mistakes, so this is how it's measured. So uh, based on the time to respond. So even if you make all the associations right, maybe for some of the associations that breaks your beliefs, you have um, to think more about it. So you have more time to respond and this might indicate that you have this implicit bias. Okay, so um, having said that, um, um, it is very important to note that uh, um, in each ecosystem, and in our case, in the, in the European Union, in Europe, so um, one of uh, the fundamental uh, pillars, of course, is human rights. And uh, to protect those, there is a non-discrimination law. Okay. Um, so in this non-discrimination law, there are some protected grounds, and those uh, cannot be used as a discrimination. Like, for instance, not giving a job. Uh, just as an example, or some other kind of discrimination. So this can be, for instance, uh, sex, sexual orientation, disability, age, 
uh, race, ethnicity, color, and membership of a national minority, nationality or national origin, religion or belief, language, social origin, birth and property, political or other, other, other opinion, and uh, other status. Um, so um, for um, the this term other status, so this is quite broadly defined and uh, mainly is uh, the differences based on identifiable uh, objective or personal characteristics or some status by which individuals or groups are distinguishable from one another. Okay, so this is how it's defined in this handbook on the European non-discrimination law. Um, and you can uh, go and, and check uh, their uh, information about these uh, protected grounds uh, and about the non-discrimination law, uh, European non-discrimination law. Um, so this, of course, uh, brings a question that is uh, very important when we think about um, developing systems that make automatic decisions that are not really decisions made by humans, but decisions made by machines, so AI and artificial intelligence, okay? Um, so since these decisions can have a huge impact in individuals and in the society, of course, there is the need to evaluate and assess those systems to make sure that they do no harm or that they somehow um, can live in the ecosystem that uh, we have. So for this reason, and I think you already heard about it uh, quite a lot uh, up to now, so um, uh, there's been a EU framework uh, for truthworthy AI in which um, different experts from different domains, including of course data science, AI, machine learning, and others in ethics and law and so on. So have um, come up together and uh, identified some key requirements of this AI system such that they can be defined truthworthy or at least in our uh, European, European Union framework. So here you can see several of uh, the key requirements like human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governments, transparency, diversity, non-discrimination and fairness, social, uh, societal and environmental well-being and accountability. So here today, as um, the title of this talk uh, is uh, referred to, so we are mainly uh, interested and in focusing on diversity, non-discrimination, and fairness. So of course, if we develop a system that makes automatic decisions, and we use these decisions um, in our everyday life, then we need to make sure that there is no discrimination uh, that is applied to any of the individuals according, of course, to the protected grounds of the European non-discrimination law. Okay, so let's go a little bit uh, more into this bias in artificial intelligence systems. So um, we know that they can be biased and we will talk a little bit about uh, how and why. Um, and also uh, how can we assess them. So this bias, so what we know is that when nowadays, just to put a little bit of context, when we talk about AI, so artificial intelligence systems, most of the time we are talking really about machine learning. So machine learning, um, it's, uh, these are the algorithms that learn from data automatically, okay? So AI is a bit more broader than machine learning um, because there are also algorithms that uh, are based on rules, uh, and they do not learn from data, for instance, but machine learning in particular is what nowadays um, 
has the power um, to make these decisions in an accuracy that it seems reasonable um, to, to deploy. So to even make systems that make decisions for us and sell the systems and make money with these systems. Okay. So these machine learning models, as I said, learn from data. And in the data, and the data will be one of the key components of uh, this bias in AI, besides which models we use, which is also a very important component. So this data, we have um, a collection of data points or, or in entries, and we have a set of this data that we use for training, which means learning the actual parameters of the model, and then we need a disjoint set of this data, so the data that has not been used for learning the parameters of the model for testing. So this is very important in machine learning algorithms, and again, I'm going to talk about this later to assess how well it generalizes to data instances, to data points that this algorithm has not seen during learning. So to new instances, because if we want systems that make decisions in our everyday life, it's um, of course obvious that uh, it, will, it won't have been trained on all the possible situations. So it needs to be able to generalize uh, to new ones. So that's why we have uh, a, test, a test set in our data to assess this generalization of the model to new instances. Um, so with these tests, uh, we evaluate how well our model um, performs. So we get some results and then we have some measures that I'm going to also talk a little bit about. And uh, we need to identify and, and decide if the results are significant, if uh, the accuracy is high enough, uh, and so on. So all this, of course, comes um, with trade-offs. Um, so, and these trade-offs are um, inevitable. So we need uh, to choose what is our data set, what uh, part of this data set is going to be our training set. We need to choose that. We also need to choose what is our test set, so what is going to be its size and the splitting of training versus testing, what is the relevance, so is the held out data, this uh, testing set that we will use to assess this generalization and say if the results are significant or not, is, is it relevant? Okay, and then there are also trade-offs uh, between accuracy and maybe speed, so maybe we want a model that is able to really make a decision very quickly, but maybe this comes with some price, maybe then the accuracy is uh, lower, okay? So there are uh, some uh, trade-offs that need to be considered here uh, and that we need to think about. Also, when we think about bias, so as I was saying, these machine learning algorithms learn from data. So somehow, uh, saying that these uh, models are free of bias, it's also a bit uh, faulty to think in this way. And also we are uh, de de um, deciding all these trade-offs, um, which are assumptions that are fundamental and that are necessary such that these uh, predictions, so what is the output of the decision of the machine learning algorithm is really usable. So this somehow can also be seen as a kind of bias. So I came across this concept um, that uh, I think was coined even by Hildebrand, which is productive bias, um, which is a good bias in a way. So um, the argument here is that all these assumptions that we make are necessary and they are uh, making this productive bias. Uh, in the machine learning model, which really allows the model to make relevant predictions, to generalize to um, new instances. Okay, 
But of course, there are some biases that we need to avoid because they are unfair and they discriminate. And this discrimination is toward these protected grounds, okay? That especially in our ecosystem, in the European Union, um, and we have this uh, non-discrimination law uh, uh, for the protected grounds, so this should be avoided. And it's also part of the EU framework of the truth truthworthy AI. Okay. So I think, um, okay. So just to summarize what, what I said uh, a little bit, so these machine le learning algorithms are built based on assumptions. There are a lot of trade-offs that we need to decide. So what algorithm we use, what is the data that we are gonna use to learn this algorithm. And there is a trade-off sometimes also uh, versus accuracy and speed. And all this is necessary to obtain like a good accuracy in the predictions and also at uh, the, the speed and performance that we want. Uh, and these assumptions are essential and it biases towards the decisions that we want to achieve from this particular algorithm, okay? But then there is a bias in, in ML that, on machine, ML with this machine learning, that we need to avoid and this is due to faulty assumptions and the, the results that we get, the decisions that it makes are systematically prejudiced and it really causes discrimination and it's unfair towards the protected grounds. So it, it comes very um, prevalent and it's very important um, this idea that we need to prevent this unfair discrimination by AI and especially nowadays um, that more and more systems are being deployed um, that make decisions that are used or either to automatize decisions or to assist humans in making these decisions that also bias the decisions of the humans in a lot of domains. So yesterday you heard a lot, uh, about healthcare. So some examples uh, of AI systems that uh, are used for Healthcare is uh, on diagnosis and treatment. And there are also domains uh, like the judiciary for recidivism risk assessment, which I'm gonna give an example, which is very famous uh, in recruiting, also screening job applicants. So if this is done automatically, and for some reason, the algorithm has learned that a particular segment of the population is not capable of doing something, this is, really discriminating a protected ground and not uh, it's and it's not based maybe in the um, individual uh, ca capabilities and skills and other domains like journalism banking and welfare um, so i think here um, um, okay um, so to connect uh, both uh, the first part that motivated my talk uh, from social psychology and, uh, and cognitive biases and, and the biases in ML, so I found this a very unique tweet, um, actually by chance, um, which uh, was talking about the equivalent of cognitive biases for ML, so machine learning, um, with uh, data fallacies uh, that we need, of course, to avoid. Um, so I, I'm going to go through some of them, not all of them, um, which are important for our talk today. So one of the most important ones is overfitting. So overfitting um, it's um, mainly uh, a concept that is very well known, very well studied, and I think almost up to now everybody checks overfitting in their machine learning algorithms. So maybe, uh, and mainly overfitting what happens is that when you have a machine learning algorithm uh, that learns the model parameters, so it feeds the training data 
so well, and here you can see it in the left uh, side of your picture, that it's representing this data and only this data. So when you have a new example, it's not able to generalize to this new example because it only represents your training data. So of course, if your model suffers from overfitting, it's completely useless because from your training data, you already know the decision because you have the ground truth. So you have the label, the decision that the algorithm should make. So no point in having a model that takes a decision for you. So what you want is to use this data because then your model will be able to make new decisions on new data points. So this is the real use of the machine learning when you deploy the system into the world. Okay, so when you avoid overfitting, then um, the accuracy that you obtain at training time, so with the training data, it reflects somehow the accuracy that you can also obtain at test time. Okay. And as I said, this is one of the first things that uh, one should check is for good practice. And that's why we, in our data set, we have the train set and then the test set because the accuracy is checked on the test set. If uh, we only checked on the train set and it's very good, this doesn't mean that it will also be good at the test set. Uh, so only if it's able to generalize, it will be also good in the test set. So another important um, characteristics of data that uh, we need to avoid is uh, this sampling bias. So which mainly is um, drawing conclusions from some set of data or uh, some set of decisions um, from the data that is not really representing what you are interested on. So here, what I'm saying is that if you are interested in detecting a particular disease, then your data should be representative of this disease uh, and not something else, for instance, right? Uh, so here in this example, uh, mainly you know, what you see is uh, some exhibition of dogs and then people ask uh, uh, if they prefer cats or dogs. So of course, if you go to an exhibition of dogs, so people in general will prefer dogs than cats, okay? Because uh, the data has not, uh, it's not representative of all the population, but it's only taken from a very specific segment. So it's really biased uh, to be sampling. So when we have a data set, it's very important that our data set is representative of what we want to predict. So another one um, is the survivor, uh, ship, uh, survivorship bias. Um, so here in this case um, is drawing conclusions or using a data set that is incomplete. Um, it's somehow related to the sampling bias in a way, but here uh, mainly what it is is that you, uh, you have this data and uh, you just have uh, a particular part of the data that has survived some selection process, for instance, or maybe some of the data uh, could not be collected um, for some reason, or some of the data was lost, and so on, um, which this, of course, uh, bias your data and can bias also what the machine learning algorithm learns, but also when you analyze it, the data, it can also uh, draw wrong conclusions, okay, because of this missing data. Another um, important aspect, and here is more, um, not only for the data, but when you analyze the results as well, and when you um, um, explain the results to the others uh, to convince in this particular case that your machine learning algorithm is capable of uh, producing these uh, decisions in an accurate way and that it's, it, has, it has a lot of value is uh, this cherry picking. So what is this cherry picking? So the cherry picking is mainly uh, 
just selecting the results that make the decisions look good and accurate and omit the rest. So this can be done um, consciously in a fraud way, or it can sometimes be also unconscious. For instance, maybe somebody gave you the results to you and forgot to send you some other results. Um, so the data could be lost uh, somehow of the results and so on. So one of the very important fundamental questions that we need to, to do when we analyze the results is ask ourselves, is this the complete picture? Is there something missing? Should, should I uh, analyze um, more into this direction or to this other direction? Okay, so to make sure that the results that we have are already as good as they look, but they are not good because we selected just the pair that um, had uh, these uh, shiny results. Um, so just to finalize this part, and as I said, there are other aspects, uh, but for us, these are the most important ones. Um, and this is also related to, to the results, how we present the results and how we do our analysis. Um, it's the danger of metric summary. So here, what you see in the screen, uh, it's mainly four different distributions that have uh, same statistics. So they have the same mean and the same variance and the same correlation. And actually, when you look at the data, they look absolutely different. So it is important that uh, we should not only rely on this metrics summary, but we should also uh, go beyond and do a very thorough analysis of uh, all the statistics that uh, we do when we analyze both our data and the results that uh, we obtain from our machine learning algorithms. Um, Okay, so just to give you a bit more context, uh, context about this, uh, uh, this was uh, four distributions were found by statistician Francis Anscombe um, in 1970s. And I think it makes a very clear point of uh, the importance of this uh, danger of metric summary. So um, as, as I was saying, um, there is this need to assess the bias of um, uh, machine learning predictions. And of course, it, this is very dependent on uh, the ethical grounds and is based on the boundaries and the ecosystem that we live in. And in our case, uh, one of the most important aspects is to, to check on the bias on these uh, protected grounds. Um, so I think maybe now would be a, a good time. I don't know if there are some questions. Uh, so it would be a good time to stop um, if you have some questions and then I can continue. Yes, thank you, Gemma. Yes, there are questions. So of course there are questions because one of the good thing about our attendees is that they do have a lot of good questions and, and good comments. So. Um, let me go through the chat because there, there was a plenty of discussion here. And we start with the uh, question from Alex that's, uh, that's asking, is there a difference if there is a bias in the trained data set or in the test set? What is worst for the overall bias or is it not important at all? Okay, so I think that's a very good question. Um, so both are very important and both should be analyzed, but it is more important, uh, in my opinion, the bias in the test set. And one of the main reasons of that is because maybe you um, are somehow a researcher that are studying invariances of representations, which means that from a single instance, you can generalize to other aspects of this instance that are not specifically encoded in the data. And this is related to the algorithm that you are using. So your algorithm maybe is robust to these other aspects. 
So that's why it's very important to check these at testing time. So in your test data, because if you don't have the representation of these different variabilities in your testing data, you will never be able to assess if your algorithm indeed um, is able to make good predictions in all these uh, different scenarios. So just to summarize, both but more in testing because then you are able to see if your decision is uh, or your model is able to generalize in the different scenarios. Thank you, Gemma. Let me read a comment on this question from Elena Jones that probably you could also comment because it's related to the question of Alex. She's confirming that's a very good point, Alex. I had had lots of difficulty training models with data sets with highly unequal distribution, for example, nine to one, of inputs in a binary classification task. What happened was that my algorithm learned to just give the answer that was right more of the time. A appear 90% of the time, B appear 10% of the time. So just always say A so that you are right 90% of the time. Do you want to comment on this? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think uh, this uh, also brings a very good point in which is very important to analyze uh, not only your test that your test set but but your training set because if you get 90 percent accuracy overall and then when you look at the data and it's just because some of you have 90 percent of your data points that in the binary case for instance is zero and it always predicts zero then your 90% accuracy is a fallacy because what it just learns is that it should always predict this because my data most of the time will appear to be like that. But maybe in the real case, it's not the case. So maybe in reality, my data is distributed in a different way and the prediction then it's not valuable. And actually, if it's always predicting the same, your algorithm, then it's not uh, a very useful algorithm. <laughs> um, so yeah, it is very important. There are techniques to mitigate this and also evaluation metrics that take into account these imbalances. Thank you. Shall we take two more questions? Sure. Okay. So there's one from Joanna. She's uh, saying, we are humans in progress. What was right yesterday doesn't mean we'll be right tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so, Dear Gemma, do you believe that the use of the algorithm, I assume machine learning or AI in general, will not perpetuate bias and pre-existing discrimination in our society? Question mark. Um, so uh, what I what I believe, and this is a this is first a personal belief, but I think it's also that is part of. Uh, a decision that we need to make as a community is that the, what is very important, especially in our ecosystem in the European Union, is that if we use algorithms that take decisions, these decisions should not uh, go beyond our values or at least our current values. And we need to be very aware that if we have a system that automatically makes decisions for us and we don't question it, they might come with consequences. So the assessing of this is very important. If we decide in 100 years, I don't know, that this is what we want, I mean, I believe it's not the right thing, but I'm now only an individual. So, so it's something that is a debate, is this something that we should discuss, but um, it is very important, the awareness of the consequences. I think that's what is very important because otherwise we can take um, all these decision-making algorithms blindly, trust them, and then be completely manipulated, for instance. Thank you. So 
It's interesting because, you know, if we take time, people ask a question, but I think there are, there's another question that I think I'd like to uh, read it to you and, and the answer to the question so you can make a comment. Mm -hmm. The question is from S. Dot Martinez and Cooper, and uh, it is, how do you prevent overfitting or correct it when it happens? And then let me read a comment of Ribi Lahiri, or Ribu Lahiri. Uh, the person said, there are many methods. It is a big topic of discussion in machine learning. Mm -hmm. The go-to is regularization of some form, depending on your algorithm. Mm -hmm. You want to maybe explain in a simple word what would be a way to uh, prevent overfitting. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, the response was uh, very good. Uh, so regularization is a very good way to do this. And uh, it's an active uh, topic of research online in machine learning. Um, so this regularization, mainly what it does, it, it constrains the model, the algorithm to just fit all the possible data points into your model to allow this generalization. Another way is to use more data that is more diverse. So again, here, when we talk about machine learning algorithms, the algorithms are very important. Data is golden because the data is what really gives the, the distribution of uh, our input that might reflect what we expect in the output. So what we will find in, in, in the world, in reality. So another good way is find good examples to include into your data. Thank yeah. you, Gemma. Shall we let you go to the second part? Absolutely, yeah. Good. So later on, um, I can take uh, more questions as well. Okay. Uh, just one second, because uh, here. So, um, uh, one of the important questions that uh, you might be asking or that we should be asking, okay, so now we know that machine learning algorithms and models might be biased and uh, they might, uh, might do um, predictions that are unfair to, towards protected grounds. So how do we check that? How do we prevent it? Uh, is there a way of assessing it? And of course there is, <laughs> uh, so that is good. So we just need to apply it. Um, so one of the things that uh, we can check is that when we have a data set, the training set, for instance, and the data set, and we look at the features that are used as input to the model to make the prediction, so uh, one of the questions that we can ask ourselves, is a protected ground feature used for prediction? So is gender used for predicting if uh, I'm gonna be hired, for instance, or if I, I'm gonna, I have a risk of committing again another crime, etc. So if it is used, then the question comes, how sensitive is this, this feature? So is it really the key feature for making the prediction or not? So that's what we need to, to, to check. So how can we check that? So we identify this uh, um, protected ground feature and we just change it. We, we randomly change it. We assign random labels. So if, we, if it can be made female, we just shuffle it. Uh, and, and, and assign a random label. And then we can check the impact on the accuracy at test set, of course. So when we uh, check the accuracy, we always uh, check at the test set of, of the data, not the, the data that we have used for learning the algorithm. But this change of uh, the feature is done both at training and at testing. Okay, so this is important. So how can we do that? Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the evaluation metrics because these evaluation metrics will give us um, an idea, a qu quantitative number 
of uh, how it affects this particular feature or how is the accuracy in general in, in different metrics, okay? Um, so here in this particular case, um, I am um, assuming a, a binary decision, so positive or negative. It can be generalized, but um, for our purposes, I think it's, it's good and it's, it's very intuitive. So uh, GT means ground truth. Predicted is the decision that the algorithm will make. Okay, and then in this matrix we have in the rows um, the positive and negative examples of the ground truth, and in the columns the positive and the negative examples of the predicted. Okay, so in the ideal case scenario, only the diagonal of the matrix, so the T, P, and T, N that you see in green, will uh, be different from zero and the other ones will be zero. Because if the other ones are zero, it means that all have been uh, correct, correctly uh, predicted. Okay, so T, P is true positive. So if an instance is positive, is uh, correctly predicted as positive. F, N is false negative, which means that when uh, an instance is actually positive, it's wrongly predicted as negative. That's why this ideally should be zero, but in reality, it's not zero <laughs> most of the times. Um, and then FP is uh, false positive. So when an instance in reality, it's ground truth GT is negative, the algorithm predicts it as positive, so that's why it's a false positive. And Tn is a true negative, so when the ground truth is negative, is predicted correctly as negative, okay? So this is what um, is called the confusion matrix because you can here identify if uh, there are confusions in the predictive, so that actual true, uh, that actual positives are, um, um, classified or predicted as negative uh, in, in a wrong way and, and all the combinations, okay? So from this matrix, we can, um, besides looking at it, which is already very informative, we can already um, also uh, compute other kinds of matrix. So here I give the, the matrix that you have as reference. So one of uh, the metric that is uh, usually very useful and um, calculated to, to see how well your algorithm uh, performs is sensitivity, which is also called recall, hit rate, or true positive rate, TPR. <laughs> so these are synonyms. So this is the fraction of true positive divided by positive. So the positive is all the positives that you have in your uh, data set, in, in this case in your test set, because this, as I said, is evaluated in the test set. So if you go to the first row of positive, positive is equal to true positive plus false negative. So the ones that were uh, not correctly identified are also originally positive. Okay, so this is sensitivity. Then there is another concept that, uh, or another metric that is uh, precision, uh, which is also called positive predictive value. And this um, is computed with the true positives, and now uh, it's divided by the sum of true positive and false positive. So that's why it's called precision, because what it measures is among all the positives that the algorithm has identified, what is the fraction that actually were true positive also in the ground truth? So the fraction that were among the positive um, um, identified correctly. Okay, so that's the precision um, or positive predictive value. And then another one that is also very commonly used is uh, specificity, which is also called selectivity or true negative rate. So this metric, what it measures is the true negative. 
So the negative that are identified correctly by the, um, um, by the algorithm, by the model, divided by all the narrative in your test set. So in the set of data that you are evaluating the model. So the negative here, we are talking about um, the ground truth. So it's the second row, um, which is the true negative plus the false positive. So also the negative in ground truth that were falsely assigned or predicted as, as positive are also part of the negative, okay? So from, uh, from these three metrics, we can also obtain um, these two plots, um, which are also very commonly used. So the first one on the left, it's called rock curve or receiver operating characteristics curve. And here what it um, measures is a relation with the true positive uh, rate with the false positive uh, uh, rate which is uh, mainly sensitivity versus one minus specificity, okay? So here, um, in the ideal case scenario, so it would be a perfect uh, sharp curve that is zero and one all the way. And uh, one of the measures that you can have as a summary of this plot is what it's called area under the curve. And this gives you an idea of how well um, your algorithm works. Um, so alternatively, you, uh, there is a, another kind of uh, curve that it's called precision recall curve, which is the one on the right hand side of uh, the presentation. So here what uh, it measures is on the X axis you have recall, which is the same as uh, sensitivity, remember, and on the y-axis you have uh, precision. Uh, so with uh, this curve, um, the, um, the main difference between uh, this rock curve and the precision recall curve is that the number of true negative results uh, is not used for making the precision recall curve, okay? So the rock curve is uh, more commonly used, but uh, sometimes when there is a highly imbalanced data set, the precision recall curve can be more informative. Okay, and uh, from the precision recall curve, we can also obtain a number, which is uh, uh, a summary metric of this curve, let's say, which is the F1 score, which I'm gonna talk about uh, next slide, but mainly uh, it's the harmonic mean of precision and recall. So uh, I want uh, to introduce three other metrics. So these metrics that I'm talking about, these are not the only ones, but they are the most commonly used. So other evaluation metrics is accuracy. So what is accuracy? So the accuracy is mainly true positive plus true negative divided by the total number of examples. So positive plus negative is mainly the sum of all the instances in your data set. So here what you are truly doing is an average across all the uh, points in your data set that you correctly uh, classified or that your model made the right decision divided by the total number of data points in your data set. Um, so here, um, talking about also the imbalanced data set that came up as a question before. So if we have a highly imbalanced data set, that for instance, we have a lot of negative and very few number of positive cases, and this can happen, for instance, in healthcare. So maybe we have a data set in which we have a lot of cases of healthy people and only very few examples of people with a particular disease because how we could collect the data or because it's a rare disease or for some other reason. So the accuracy sometimes can be not so informative because if 90% of our data is negative and always our model says that 
no matter what is the input, it's negative, then the accuracy will be 90%, which seems really high, but actually it's not. It's just always outputting the same, and it's not a useful model. So for the reason, there is uh, another metric, which is called balance accuracy, which mainly averages sensitivity and, speci and specificity, taking into account this true positive rate and the true negative rate together. Okay, and then finally, as I said here, um, I just put the formula of the F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of precision and sensitivity uh, that you can uh, plot in this precision recall uh, curve as well. Okay, so now uh, we know how we can quantitatively uh, measure um, this uh, uh, performance of our data set. I don't want to say accuracy because I just said the accuracy is a particular formula. So let's say performance with different metrics. Um, so now we can assess uh, our, our predictions or the predictions of the model that we have based on a feature that is a protected ground. So um, mainly what we do is we take the data as we have it, we train our data set, and then we evaluate it uh, with the test set and have our results with the evaluation matrix. Uh, first, of course, we need to compute the confusion matrix, and then we can obtain all the, the results. Now, what we do is for all the points in the data set, both training and testing, we just uh, shuffle the, actually we only do a testing. What we do is uh, we go to this protected ground feature and we shuffle it. So we randomly assign uh, different values, okay? Uh, and what we do is now we evaluate again the performance of the model um, and we check uh, if the performance has changed. So now here I have uh, two confusion matrices. One for the case in which I didn't change the feature and another one in which I did change the feature randomly. So if the, the results of the matrix, so if the quantities of the matrix are different, it means that the algorithm heavily relies on this feature. And of course, this is not good. <laughs> So what can we do? So we retrain the model, um, removing the features with this protected ground. Um, and maybe here what might happen is that the accuracy or the, the matrix will be lower, but the model will be, fair, uh, will be fairer, okay? And this is what is important. Also because it may be that we also don't have like uh, a very good distribution of, in our testing set. So uh, we need to make sure that when we go to the real world, it's not biased towards this protected ground. So I want to mention an important note here. So it's, it's very easy to then identify features that are directly related to these protected grounds, like sex or race or disability, etc. or where do you live? But there are other features that might have uh, some relation and that the, the information is implicit. So um, it is important to, to do this uh, check with, uh, most of, with all the features to see if there is really a very high impact of one particular feature because this particular feature might have some information that we don't want to use. Okay, so um, another uh, aspect that uh, we need uh, to, to check is the distribution of output. So here we are not talking about the decision of the machine learning algorithm, so the prediction, but we are really talking about our data set. So what data uh, we are using, both at training and at testing. So what, First thing that we need to, to check is if uh, 
the, the decision, so the output, 0, 1, it means binary, is equally distributed by all protected grounds. So what I mean is that, um, for instance, in the case of healthcare, um, uh, are both male and female equally represented, or are also different races equally represented, are and check for all the protected grounds, or at, at least the ones that we think might have an impact um, in the decision. And this, again, this is checking the data. Okay, so it's counting how many of these I have with this output in my data, how many I have um, with this other output in my data. Of course, for being able to do this, it's important to have the information. So even though these features should not be used for learning the model, they can be used for analyzing the statistics in your data set. Okay, because otherwise what would happen is that there is an indirect discrimination. So if most of the examples in my data set are females, then maybe the predictions for male are not well done. We haven't checked, okay? So again, it's important to check uh, this distribution in the data. And then another thing that is very important is now taking the algorithm, the machine learning algorithm when analyzing the predictions so before what we did is just change one feature and check all the, the metrics that we wanted to check by changing this feature. But another important aspect is to really analyze the, I said here accuracies, but the metrics of uh, performance of our machine learning algorithm for the different protected grounds, which means that uh, it's important to have different um, confusion matrices for the different protected grounds. So for instance, one particular protected ground, we only take these examples and then we compute all the metrics and then we have for the rest and we compare. Is this, uh, are the metrics comparable or not? Is there like a clear uh, bias? So for instance, is it more accurate for males than females? Uh, and so on. So the, the performance, accuracy on other metrics of the uh, artificial intelligence system is equally distributed across different protected grounds is something that can also be analyzed and should be analyzed. Okay, so um, um, now I want to discuss an example of machine bias, which is very famous and um, has been actually very heavily discussed um, in the literature and in the media, and it has had a huge impact in uh, also um, bringing up this topic of fairness in AI and the need for avoiding this uh, bias in machine learning. Um, so this example is related to racial bias and there is this paper which is called Machine Buyers. There's software used across the country, and the country in this case is the US, to predict future crim criminals and it's biased against blacks, uh, which is by Arwin and colleagues and was published in 2016. So here um, in the US, uh, so there is a, an algorithm uh, which is called Compass. So it's a software for, uh, except the people that work in the company is a black box um, that makes decisions uh, to predict the likelihood of a person committing a future uh, crime, okay? So this uh, software, it's actually used, it's actively used uh, in the US and sometimes it's also used in court to also um, uh, give us an extra input uh, for the final decision um, of the defendant, okay? Of the sentence to a particular defendant. 
So I'm going to show you some examples, um, um, which uh, so I took from ProPublica. So this uh, particular analysis and study was done by ProPublica because um, so they became aware of this problem, and even though also it was raised uh, even uh, by U.S. Uh, defendant attorneys. Uh, that uh, there might be bias, uh, that these algorithms might be also biased in decisions in court and so on. Uh, this algorithm, this software was never assessed uh, independently, but was still used. So ProPublica uh, did this uh, more thorough analysis uh, to see if there was somehow any bias in uh, this uh, risk prediction of uh, so the likelihood of a person um, doing uh, another crime in the future, okay? So um, here we have uh, two different people for the uh, UE arrest. Uh, so Gregory and Mallory, Gregory Lugo and Mallory Williams. And here we see some of characteristics. So Gregory Lugo had uh, um, prior offenses, uh, three DUIs and one battery, and Mallory Williams had uh, two misdemeanors. And then after this risk assessment, uh, there was a follow-up because in this ProPublica, what they did is the analysis went to check if the predictions of the algorithm actually match reality in the future. So they did a longitudinal study. So what the, it happened is that um, in the first one, there was one uh, subsequent offense and the one on the right, non-subsequent offense, which doesn't reflect uh, the risk of reoffending. okay? So low risk is low number and higher number is higher risk. And here you can see um, the pictures of the people. So, okay, so one has, uh, a lighter color of the skin and is a male, the other is a female, and is a colored person. Um, this is one example. And now we have another example. So here again, we have two uh, people and we have information about prior offense and then subsequent offenses and the one that was um, um, labeled with lower risk had actually uh, subsequent offenses where the other with high risk didn't have any. And uh, here we have the pictures. Um, and we have, uh, I just have here three examples um, with a very similar pattern. And, uh, and again, I want to emphasize that uh, this uh, was a black box software that was making these uh, decisions of uh, risk of commuting a future crime or not. Um, so after this analysis, and it was longitudinal because they did follow-ups with the people that um, had been predicted uh, with low or high risk of committing this future crime. So what they what they found is that systematically the ratings, the risk ratings, um, uh, were at high risk for uh, black defendants and low risk for white defendants, uh, which indicates, of course, a clear racial bias of the machine learning algorithm. We don't know if it's machine learning of this software. Uh, because as I said, it's a black box. Um, so the problem also, so it's not only that it's a racial bias, is that it's also not reflecting reality because during the follow-ups, then when you checked um, if the high-low risk were actually matching what would happen in the future was not um, accurate at all, okay? And of course, it comes at a very, very high risk of having this bias also um, having an impact on the decision that are made in courtrooms for these people, okay? And, and here we see a clear example in which the software also bias the decision of the humans, 
Okay. Of course, um, this is uh, what uh, ProPublica published, and then um, it, they were saying in courtrooms that it was not that uh, taken into account, and also from the from the company they had a rebuttal and they said that it was not that biased. But what happened is that, again, the way of assessing the accuracy of the algorithm from the company point of view was not reflecting this uh, racial bias. They were using other kinds of measures, okay? So it's not that they were saying something that was not true, it's just that the analysis on the assessment was not completely thorough, okay? So here I just want to show you uh, some of the plots that you can find also in this, in this article from ProPublica that, uh, so after this also other people made uh, the, the same analysis because the data is publicly available and is one of the examples that is always brought up because this actually uh, had a real impact because it was actively used uh, in the society in the US. Okay, so here what uh, you say is that um, here mainly um, white defendants uh, were um, predicted as more likely to, uh, to have low risk of uh, doing a future crime, whereas black defendants um, in this case was more equally distributed. And, uh, and now I'm gonna show you some other tables with, the, um, with some of the results that are a bit more um, quantitative. So here what we say, and as a conclusion, that the prediction fails differently for black defendants. So the ones that are labeled at higher risk but didn't reoffend uh, in African-American were almost 45% uh, of the times, so while in whites only at 23.5, uh, so these are false positive rate. So the ones that were labeled as high risk, but didn't uh, actually reoffend. And the label lower risk, uh, but they did reoffend. So it's the opposite. So for whites was 47.7. So they said they were labeled as low risk, but they, uh, actually committed more crimes, well, in African-Americans were uh, 28%. So this is the false uh, negative rate. Um, so overall, overall, this software Compass, which is uh, the North Point is the name of the company, company so correctly predicts this uh, recidivism 61% of the times. Okay, so if you take all the data set and you evaluate this accuracy is 61% of the time. But then when you do this analysis in which you really analyze uh, only blacks and only whites in a separate way, uh, what happens uh, It's what it says here, but blacks are almost twice as likely as whites to be labeled a higher risk, but not actually real fan. So, this makes it makes this, the software makes the opposite mistake among whites. They are much more likely than blacks to be labeled lower risk, but go on to commit other crimes. Okay, so I think this is a very clear example uh, that happened in reality in the real world to make a very clear point of the importance uh, of these asset assessments. Uh, of bias in AI systems on, even if they are black boxes. So we can do the analysis um, with a black box. Okay, so um, uh, this brings me almost to the end of my talk. So I wanted to finish um, just giving a couple of examples of tools uh, that exist for assessing fairness in AI. I think that some of these tools um, you are learning or you will learn in the, in the labs uh, part of the course. But nevertheless, I just wanted to mention them because I know that maybe some of you 
are not taking the, the lab part of the course. Um, so there are, there are many of them, I just uh, will uh, mention a couple. So there is one that it's by Google that is called What If, and uh, there, there, there are demos online that uh, you can play with and you can also download um, their APIs and, and use them to make all these analysis that we discussed or the distribution of the data based on the different uh, features and also the distribution of the predictions and so on. Uh, another one, um, it's uh, AI 360 by IBM Research and uh, also you can uh, do this analysis and here they also uh, have some um, tools in which you can uh, use some techniques uh, to avoid these unfair predictions, which sometimes work, sometimes not, uh, don't work. So uh, you can also do this in your models. So for instance, if you have a very high and balanced data set, Maybe you, when you use uh, the data for learning the algorithm, you can just uh, duplicate those ex examples. So the distribution overall, even though these are repeated examples, is the same. This is a way. You can also use some weights uh, for the um, accuracy of a, a particular protected ground and the rest, and so on. Uh, so again, this might affect the overall accuracy, but then when you go to the specific uh, protected grounds, then it's much, it, it's more fair. Uh, so these trade-offs that I think you will also talk about in other lectures uh, is something that um, the one needs to take into account. Uh, well, and before going to the take-home messages, of course, one can also do the tools themselves so if one likes to program um, python for instance is a very good language for doing all these analysis which has a lot of libraries uh, that one can use uh, like pandas and uh, for the data set analysis and so on which i think will also be explained in the labs okay so um, to finalize my talk uh, i just wanted to to bring up a few points uh, which I hope are the take home messages of the talk. Um, so mainly what is fair ML and uh, how we determine it. Of course, this uh, depends uh, in the ecosystem we live and we are in the European Union and one of our pillars are the human rights. So the, the, the decisions and the predictions that the ML are producing uh, should uh, be non-discriminatory and should be fair across all the protected grounds. Um, we need to avoid this unfair bias in machine learning predictions, uh, as I said, uh, towards all the protected grounds. Uh, and I explain how we can how we can check if there is this bias um, in the model. And then there are also tools to mitigate this. Um, so just to finalize, so we need uh, a regulation that really defines uh, an assessment process for uh, the decision-making AI systems. Because if we use those uh, AI systems that take decisions for us in the world, in the real world, in the society, so this can have a huge impact in our everyday life and we need to make sure that these decisions are non-discriminatory. So um, the diversity, non-discrimination and fairness uh, is one of the key requirements for truthworthy AI and uh, we should uh, make sure that uh, we come up with an assessment um, system and process uh, that uh, in a way certifies that this is the case. And um, just to finalize, and I think you will also hear more about it. So this is uh, one of the goals of uh, the, the team that uh, Roberto has put together and that I am very, very, very honored uh, to work with. 
Uh, so with that, uh, I finish my talk and I thank you uh, for your attention and I take questions. Thank you, Gemma, for the very interesting talk. Uh, of course, there are questions. Um, not only questions, there are really very deep comments because uh, the course is really interdisciplinary. So you can see, um, let me go through the chat because um, there's so many comments and questions that I will need to go through myself. Um, let me start with one from Alex. It says, is there anything like blacklisting in assessing bias in algorithm so that you think about possible bias output at the beginning and forbid them by default in the algorithm AI, something like AI test driven development? Um, so, uh, if I understand correctly the question, so um, here I can take it from two sides. So one side is to design the algorithm, the AL algorithm, taking into account that there is no bias or that at least it enforces this in the algorithm, in the objective function. And uh, this is one of the directions that some people are taking, which as I said, sometimes what happens is that it harms a little bit the overall performance, but then it's really fair or more fair across the different protected grounds. Uh, so really enforcing uh, this fairness. So the blacklisting, uh, I'm not sure exactly what it means. <laughs> Uh, so if there is an AI algorithm that could assess another AI algorithm, maybe? Uh, I think it, uh, I think it what the, the question was meant is if you do know beforehand that there is certain elements that are not really wanted, so like a blacklist, you don't want that, is there any way you could feed them into the system so that they avoid doing that mistake? That's what I understood about the question. Mm. Yes, but again, this is, so uh, at the end, the algorithm, so how gender is encoded? It's a feature that is, for instance, zero if it's male and one if it's female. So the, the computer per se doesn't know the real meaning of the feature. So the human knows the meaning of this feature. So this should be really in the design, so that uh, so this feature should not be there. Uh, so maybe this could be blacklisted uh, feature, for instance. Thank you. Uh, well, some of the questions are really um, very deep. So let me take one from uh, Martinez and Cooper. Mm -hmm. The question is, if there is a group of people or demographic that's already facing discrimination in society. Does the machine learning algorithm have to be tweaked to be nudged in their favor to accomplish some sort of compensation for their disparaged position? Okay, yeah. So I think this is a very important question uh, because so what might happen is that this discrimination might be reflected in the data because this discrimination is happening in society. So of course in the data it is reflected, okay? So yes, it has to be somehow tweaked, uh, this information or this, this, um, this decision uh, because otherwise, uh, if it's not taken into account, the algorithm learns from the distribution of the data. If the data is biased, the prediction will be biased, that is for sure. So this is a very fundamental point and very fundamental question. Thank you. Uh, I have a very long comment from Elena Jones that I'd like to read it to you and to everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe you can comment. It's not really a question, but I think it, it helps on the discussion. So mm -hmm. he says, 
Uh, she was actually making two comments before, and then now she's making a summary. Let's okay. say. Uh, I guess with my two last comments, I wanted to get this point across, which is this one here. Mm -hmm. Our model dash understanding of how different features interact dash correlate dash cause each other is critical when considering how we use protected grounds. Mm -hmm. If I am blindly using a protected grounds list without considering confounders that shape my distribution of data, for example, zip code correlating with race and socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. I might account only for protected grounds, race and class, without considering other things that implicitly code for this protected ground, zip code. Mm -hmm. It is important to build a model slash understanding of the casual relation of the features accounted for in the model first before trying to remove bias because I might, I might just live in features that bias my algorithm. Um, you have the same experience or you were on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think, uh, I hope I could make the point when I was talking about um, analyzing the, the different protected ground features. Uh, maybe it was a very small point, but that was exactly what I wanted to say. So thank you for the comment. So there might be other kinds of features and zip code could be a very good one because maybe there are neighborhoods uh, uh, that, uh, I don't know, are more, more people that are richer live there, for instance. So it's an indicative of wealth, could be, uh, which have some correlation of uh, also some other protected grounds. Uh, that, so this relation can be a kind of proxy of the protected ground. Uh, so that's why checking which of the features are really uh, important for making the prediction and which relation they have with the protected grounds uh, is, is a key point of the analysis for the assessment. So yeah, that's a very important uh, aspect and yeah, thank you for the comment. There's another comment which probably might be interesting for you and to everybody from Joanna. She's referring to a case where a uh, an Apple customer reported on November 2019 that a program by Apple called Apple Card mm -hmm. was biased against gender. Basically, Apple Box algorithm gave 20 times higher credit limit to him and not to his wife. So the, let me, this is a comment, so this is just a case. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I add a question myself. Um, obviously, this is a black box. So the question is, when you have a situation where the product is sold as a black box, so meaning by intellectual property, you're not allowed to get into the black box, what techniques do you know can be applied to verify if the, if, the, if the black box is producing bias uh, prediction or bias output. You, can you maybe comment that? Comment that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, if uh, we have a black box that makes decisions, so what we can do is uh, obtain decisions from a test set that we can even generate. And uh, if we generate this test set, then we can uh, control uh, the different conditions in which we are interested to, to check if there is bias or not. Um, so we just fit the input and then evaluate the accuracy. Of course, we will need to, to check uh, ourselves the correlations and analysis, but even if we have a, a black box, uh, so there is no need uh, to know exactly what's happening inside uh, if we are only finding relations between the input or particular labels on protected grounds and the prediction, because we just need to know the input and the output. So it is still possible to do this analysis. Thank you. Uh, are you still having some energy for answering more questions? Sure. 
Okay. So tell me when, when you are tired, you say thank you. And then, because I have more questions. So, I mean, this is the good. What I like about this series of lectures that the attendees, first of all, some of them are so qualified that they, their answer and comments are a part of the lecture. So this is becoming a really, and a very nice experience, at least for mm -hmm. me. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, it is really amazing. So thank you, everybody. Um, there's a question for Marcia Mrotz. Hopefully I pronounce it in a way that Marcel will not really be met with me. And he, and he said, are there any methods to identify unimplicit bias, like some flag to alert that some data is overrepresented, like in the example of predictive policy, racial bias by not might not explicit, but they're, they're there, but it is, but it can be related to some specific district of the city and the representation in the data. That's yeah, question. yeah. So, so here it comes uh, with the analysis of the statistics in the data for each particular feature, and uh, and then identify if there is uh, some relation uh, between. A particular feature, like for instance, zip code, and a protected ground. Um, of course, the the analysis and the assessment is done by a human, but this doesn't mean that we cannot find uh, these underrepresented uh, parts or segments of the population that should be there and are not there. So um, this can be part of the analysis. Uh, the question that we have to pose is uh, which. Uh, kind of analysis should I do to um, make sure that I can really identify this? Um, so that's why it's also important um, to involve in this process different domain experts uh, of the particular domain in which the machine learning is uh, applied. Because uh, as I said, data is golden, the features are very important and which are also features that might have an impact and that might be related to protected grounds is something that we can identify also uh, being more knowledgeable about the domain. Thank you, Gemma. Well, there is a comment from Joanna that I think you and me will find it very interesting. I read mm -hmm. it and then you'll see why I think we find it interesting. She said, important, quote, Rohit Chopra of the US Federal Trade Commission warns that, quote, not only are the algorithms not public, so black box, mm -hmm. but many companies treat them as proprietary trade secrets, so intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And in addition, algorithms can evolve in real time without a paper trade of data inputs or equation used to develop a prediction, mm -hmm. making them difficult or impossible to track. In mm -hmm. addition, victims of discriminatory algorithms rarely, if ever, know that they have been victimized. It's not a question, it's just a, an information. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great comment and I think it's, it's a real concern because uh, we might have uh, an AI that is used in society and that we might more or less know how it works because it has been released information vaguely because again, it's proprietary information, but at least with some statistics of predictions and so on. But what we don't know is what will happen in the future. So how are these algorithms updated? Um, and how do they keep track of the accuracy and the impact of the predictions uh, when there are these updates. So I think, yeah, it's, it's a very, very important comment, very insightful. Thank you. Which is also related to the example that we saw yesterday in healthcare, in medical devices. So that's really very relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have energy, I'll give you an, a couple of more questions. Sure, yeah. I yeah. think we, we have a time until four, so a couple yeah, more I questions. Want, I don't want to make sure that you collapse before <laughs> finish. Um, um, let me, okay. This, this is really a, a comment from Eberhard. 
Eber Ashnebel, who's a, uh, um, he is an expert in ethics, and he, he said, is there a difference between unuseful bias, as I mentioned in the AI model, and unethical? And then he says something like, following the discussion before, the usefulness of measure bias is stabilizing the path and is not an, if, an ethical qualifier. Maybe we can break up this question because it's not, I mean, we need some kind of uh, things to digest. The first one is basically asking if unwanted bias or unuseful bias, is there anything like an unuseful bias, first of all? Unuseful, so that is not useful? Yes. Uh, well, I, I don't know if useful is the right word. So uh, I would say in this context, more unfair bias. Um, in the sense that, so the machine learning le learns from the data. And then if our also test set is biased in some sense, like some segments of the population are not represented and the accuracy is very high. In this particular sense, is my bias useful? Yes, because maybe I just have this narrow focus on checking the accuracy at the test set. But if I use this model out in the world, but I haven't checked for unfair biases. So the usefulness of this bias is no longer true because it's not fair. It, it doesn't apply to reality. So it's not applicable, mm -hmm. but at least it's unfair. So we shouldn't use it. And does it mean it's unethical? So I think here ethical, unethical. So I'm not uh, an ethics uh, expert. But from my understanding, uh, so this really uh, is defined by the ecosystem and the boundaries that we live in. So in our case, the European Union with the human rights as a foundation pillar. Uh, so here, uh, unethical would mean that uh, the bias is uh, discriminating protected grounds. Thank you. Let me ask you this question. Hopefully I didn't ask you already. So if I did, uh, let me know, but I don't think so. This is from Vincent Mai. The question is, what can we do to prevent the risk that AI that we develop in countries where such grounds are protected is not used for discrimination purposes in places where these laws do not exist? for example, to predict sexual orientation. I refer here to the double use of this technology. Mm -hmm. I actually make a comment, I say, amazing question, Vincent. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very important. It's, it's something that, uh, I mean, it's not only for me to, to answer, but really like experts uh, in a consensus from different domains and also from ethics, law, and not only machine learning, but also the domains in which uh, this is applied. And um, yeah, when we cross these boundaries, uh, it, it might become a problem because if uh, suddenly uh, we import something, a machine learning system that has been developed in a place uh, with different boundaries, let's say, um, and we want to use it here, ideally we should check that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, well established also in our ecosystem that uh, so it's not unfair uh, towards protected grounds, for instance. Uh, so um, yeah, actually these boundaries are very important uh, to, for this assessment. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, I have two, two comments, the last two comments. Mm -hmm. but before I make these two comments, I want to share with everybody that exactly from these comments, one can see how the problem is, is complex because um, we've seen some uh, definition of fairness and bias at the level of machine learning that are like kind of engineering 
definition. And then you start seeing, and I, I read now the two comments, um, how the whole thing goes higher in, in, in the layers of abstraction level. So let me read two comments to you. And we probably this is the, the grand finale of, of the whole lecture because one is from Joanna and then there is a reply from Eberhard. Joanna said, for example, slavery centuries ago was accepted as something normal religious, culture, and etc. And after some gradual social evolution, it changed little by little until it was abolished. So piggyback on that, Eberhard says, these problems remain because our world is always predominated. The question would be, what amongst the old buyers are the ones that we will use and like to be continue, which one will perpetuate the survival of humanity, which one do we want to change? Now, I do not expect that this is a question for a machine learning engineer, but it gives you an idea, you can comment of course, Gemma, but it gives you an idea how the, 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 the term bias, fairness, is embedded in completely different context. If you have any comment, that could be maybe the, the final wrap up of your lecture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and I agree. And I think uh, here again is uh, to put emphasis in that this process of assessment and decision of what is important to check and what are the biases that we, we want to look at is something that we have to do with different domain experts in a round table, each of them bringing their own perspectives because only then we can kind of talk in the same language, put together the knowledge uh, from the different perspective and then hopefully come up with uh, some uh, conclusion that, uh, or at least some recommendation that um, uh, is more broad and it's not narrow to only one domain. Thank you, Gemma. I think we really arrived to the end of our lecture. Thank you for taking time in answering all these questions and thank you everybody for attending and making comments and having great questions. So um, wish you all um, excellent rest of the day and uh, we'll reconnect next week for continue our lecture. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure to be with you. And thank you so much for all the fantastic questions that uh, everybody had. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto, for having me.